place. And um, so I'll be, I'll be so the work I'll be talking about is somewhat related to the, you know, to the previous uh, talks, the Sandra's talk um, before lunch. And uh, but I'm going to be, you know, looking at um, sort of scattering of waves in a somewhat more general context. Um, so, but uh, the, out the brief outline is as follows. I'm going to uh, start with some motivation and I'm going to uh, start with the motivation with uh, ocean waves, but given the previous talk, I will go through that material very, very quickly since everyone's familiar with it. Um, I'll talk about the role that uh, ray dynamics and specifically caustics can have uh, in the formation of uh, extreme waves in the ocean and in other contexts. Um, I will explain how uh, wave height statistics can be obtained uh, from ray dynamics and how one can, one can really make quantitative predictions. And then I will come back um, uh, in the, the, the latter part of the talk to ray dynamics and talk about the evolution of the stretching of exponent, which seems to be something very general. Okay, so I'd like to um, just start out by uh, thanking uh, uh, collaborators, uh, Rick Heller in particular, who, uh, with whom I really um, who really got me interested in this, uh, in this type of work. Unfortunately, he's not here today, but I understand he'll be joining us uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, collaborates from Marburg on one part of, the, of this work and, uh, and some students from uh, Tulane. Okay, so this is just a picture of an ocean wave. This is an old picture. I think this is uh, an extreme wave uh, captured in the Bay of Biscay off the coast of France. Um, I'll, again, as I said, We've seen all, all of this before lunch, so I'll just go through this very, very quickly. Um, the, the most important uh, um, point here is that there are these extreme waves in the ocean, uh, and some of them uh, you know, are much taller than what you would expect to see in your lifetime based on, um, um, based on random wave model uh, predictions, which is the Rayleigh distribution. Um, and for a long time, they were disbelieved by oceanographers, but there was evidence uh, which we already uh, saw in the previous talk of, uh, of an event captured uh, on an oil platform in the North Sea. And more recently, there's also satellite data that's telling us that these waves do exist, and they're much more frequent than what you'd expect from uh, random wave statistics, right? So, um, so we already know that um, there's sort of the linear, you know, the, the oceanographers who work in this area you know, they uh, take either a linear or nonlinear approach, and nonlinear instabilities are very important, particularly um, when you're thinking about a quasi one dimensional setup such as a wave tank. But um, in two dimensions, certainly, uh, nonlinear effects are also important, uh, but they're not nearly as important. And here, uh, for, for this talk, I will focus on, on uh, linear refraction. We've also done some work on the nonlinear case, and I'm happy to talk about that with anybody who's interested, right? And this kind of approach to, uh, to studying uh, extreme ocean waves was, you know, it's, it's over 20 years old now, originated by uh, White um, and Formberg in, the, in this context. So the basic idea is, um, is that we're thinking of uh, these ocean waves in the ray limit, and, uh, and we're thinking of the ocean waves as being refracted by ocean currents, right? So you have these waves uh, and they're being bent because there are these random ocean currents. The ocean currents come in eddies which can typically be of size several kilometers or even tens of kilometers much larger than the wavelength, right? So that, um, so that means that we're going to be in a kind of semi-classical limit. Um, also, the typical current speeds are going to be small compared to the typical speed of ocean waves, or we're going to be in a weak scattering regime. So that's really what's going to be most important for, uh, for our purposes, right? So, um, so, so that means that we're in a regime of weak semi-classical scattering. Again, the two key assumptions are the correlation length of the potential is large, much larger than the wavelength, so we're semi-classical, and the scattering is weak or small angle uh, scattering. So, so here's just, just a little picture kind of to, to illustrate uh, you know, what, uh, what happens, how the, um, how the focusing occurs. So you imagine having these uh, parallel rays, right, which is 
if you like, that's a plane wave coming in from above. But so we're looking at a plane wave in the ray picture. And now we have these two current eddies. Here current is circulating this way. Here current is circulating that way. And if it's, it's basically as far as, uh, as, far as this, um, this picture is concerned, it's completely equivalent to thinking about particle dynamics, uh, move it, particles moving in the potential and having a dip in the potential somewhere here, right? So the rays, of course, all get bent and they get focused. So here you have, you have a caustic, you have infinite ray density. Here you have also parallel, uh, nearby parallel rays focusing over here, and, and then you have parallel rays coming in over uh, here. They get focused over here. So, they, so you have, uh, uh, at every one of these points, you have infinite classical uh, density, right? If, this, if you imagine this were a perfect parabolic lens, then of course everything would get focused at a single point, so you can think of this as a bad a lens with a lot of aberration, so different paths focus um, at different points, right? So, so generically what you get in this kind of situation is, um, is sort of a line of caustics where here you have an initial cusp singularity and then there are two branches. Each of, uh, every point along each of these two branches is, uh, is a fold singularity again with infinite density uh, of classical rays. So, but what we've uh, seen so far is really a caricature because this, because the, the previous picture implies that you have one eddy or one dip in the potential that does the focusing. And again, as I said, that's not what's happening in the real world, certainly not in the regime we're interested in because we're interested in a regime of weak scattering, right? So if you have weak scattering, you have, of course, focusing and defocusing, but it takes many, many focusing and defocusing events until you get to an actual caustic, right? Where two trajectories uh, are going to meet, right? And one can do a simple uh, estimate, basically just based on a uh, random walk, which tells you that uh, the distance you have to travel for the singularities uh, uh, to form is going to be uh, proportional to xi, which is the correlation length of your potential, uh, times this ratio, which tells you how strong the scattering is. So this is uh, the root mean square speed of the, uh, of the currents divided by the incoming velocity of, uh, of the ocean wave, right? So if you're doing quantum mechanics, this would be, for example, uh, the RMS uh, potential fluctuations divided by the kinetic energy, right? So this is just uh, just the strength of scattering. So this is some small number, and uh, and so this means, of course, you need to do you need to do many scattering events uh, before you form the singularities. But nevertheless, the singularities certainly occur if you wait uh, if you wait for the right amount of time. And then, because this is a chaotic system, once you have one of these caustics, these branches, of course, you're undergoing further um, further scattering, further refraction. And then you have a proliferation of branches branching out into more branches, et cetera, um, et cetera. And so the number of branches eventually will uh, grow exponentially um, with this typical distance scale. Okay. So this is just, just a few pictures just to illustrate. Again, none of this is really specific to the ocean context. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an you know, old experiment for in uh, nanostructure. So he, here you have um, um, a two-dimensional electron gas. And, uh, and you, have, um, you have basically a small, uh, small opening here, a quantum point contact. Uh, you apply a gate voltage and um, uh, bias voltage, sir. And, um, and, uh, so you, and, and then you try to basically measure, uh, measure the electron uh, current density, more or less. Uh, I'm not going to worry exactly you know, what is uh, pictured here but you can sort of think of this as roughly something related to the current density, and you can see these strong branches, right? And again, the idea is that basically you have some kind of random potential here coming from impurities, coming from the donor ions, and whereas naively you would just expect to see some kind of Gaussian random distribution of intensity, you know, in reality, so you see these long branches that, you know, survive for a long time. And there are, you know, many, many other examples. I'll I'll show you in a minute an example uh, from the Marburg group and microwave resonators um, 
uh, Steve uh, Tomsek, who's here, you know, uh, did work a long time ago, um, you know, studying this uh, sort of thing in the context of ocean acoustics. And I think Michael Berry, in the context of the, the previous talk, already mentioned uh, the twinkling of starlight is, you know, is basically the same, uh, the same kind of effect. So uh, just another picture. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is actually a uh, computer simulation, but this is, um, this is simulating the wave height coming from, uh, from an earthquake. This is, this is tsunami wave height. Uh, from an earthquake off the coast of Japan, which occurred in 2011, and uh, and again you're seeing you know this very uh, this very typical structure um, you know characteristic of uh, of the branched uh, branched flow right where you know somebody who's um, you know unlucky enough right to be in one you know in one of these red regions right is um, you know is going to experience much greater uh, wave heights you know here. Uh, the scattering is from you know things like islands and variations in the um, in the um, in the in the sea floor is, is what scattering is what's acting as the scattering for uh, for the tsunami. Okay. Continue again. Just going through this very briefly. And this is the microwave experiment. I promise now, uh, where you have the experiment and the ray simulation. Now, unfortunately, uh, the for the microwave experiment. We're not really in the semi-classical limit, right? The wavelength is roughly of the same order as the size of the scattering. So qualitatively, you definitely, you know, have this uh, this picture, uh, but not in a not in a quantitative sense. Okay. All right. So um, so now we need to sort of uh, try to see how all of this connects up to uh, statistics. What can you actually, you know, besides showing nice pictures, can you actually calculate something? And, uh, and so the answer is yes, but, uh, but we, do, we do have to keep in mind that in real life there's going to be some kind of uh, smearing. So again, the original picture was you have an incoming plane wave, and if you have an incoming plane wave and it gets scattered, then you're guaranteed to get these caustics form if you wait long enough, right? So, but that would imply that if you go out into the ocean, basically every time you're going to see a rogue wave, which is not what happens, right? And the reason that's not what happens is because, uh, is because in reality you, have, you don't have a single uh, incoming plane wave. You actually have a spread of wavelength and you have a spread of uh, initial angle in the incoming wave, right? So there's so uh, so your initial uh, condition is not a is not a manifold, it's not a line, right? Uh, in phase space, it's something that's smeared out, and then when you undergo scattering, and then you undergo the subsequent uh, evolution, and then you project onto the po onto position, you don't uh, you don't see infinite densities, but you s see these sort of uh, hot spots and cold spots. The hot spots corresponding to sort of where the caustics would be uh, if you didn't have any smearing, right? So, so you can see so that there are sort of two important scales here. Uh, one is sort of the amount of scattering, and you can think of it as scattering in momentum or scattering in angle. Um, that's uh, that's due to um, um, that's due to the ocean currents in this case, or whatever your scatterers are. And then you have the um, the initial. Uh, spread in the initial conditions, and it's the ratio uh, of these two quantities that's going to be the important uh, physical parameter, right? So, so you can compare uh, the strength of the scattering, which again depends on, um, on the fluctuations in the potential, uh, divided by the initial angular spread, and that's something that Rick Heller calls uh, the freak index. And the idea is that the stronger the freak index, the closer you are to, to the classical regime where you have actual uh, caustics. But in, the important thing is that in real life, even though you're not going to be in that regime where the, um, where the uh, freak index uh, gamma goes to infinity, even at finite values where everything is smeared out, you still see significant effects on the wave. So here's just some uh, simulation. Um, and here it just turns out that, uh, so for this, this delta theta is the initial angular spread. So the waves are coming in from the left. Uh, they're moving in this direction. To, they're moving from left to right. 
and with an angular, initial angular spread of plus and minus 10 degrees, right? And then you clearly see these hot spots, right? Again, they're washed out. You don't have infinite density, but they're quite strong, quite strong contrast. This corresponds to a freak index of around one. Uh, this here, you're more spread out. The initial conditions are more um, spread out, so, um, so the effect is more smeared out. This corresponds to a freak index of one half, but nevertheless, you clearly see these signatures of above average intensity and below average intensity. Okay, and, uh, and this, this just shows, um, in this case, so things are rotated a little bit, so now the wave is coming in from above. Again, up here, you have a random superposition of plane waves going down. Uh, the white regions are the regions of higher intensity. And, um, and now what we want to connect that to is we want to connect that to the probability of actually seeing an extreme wave, right? And that's what we're seeing here. So we already heard about the significant wave height, right? So which happens to be basically four times the standard deviation. So, uh, so, so um, oceanographers call extreme waves something that's taller from, um, from crest to trough, uh, taller than three significant wave heights, so 12 standard deviations. And every time we see one, we, see, we get a red dot. And not surprisingly, basically all the red dots are in regions of high classical ray density. Right? So that's, again, not surprising. You have more energy there. You're more likely to see an extreme, um, an extreme wave. Right? The other thing that, um, that I want to point out here, which will be important later, is that you see that um, you see a lot of these red dots kind of early on um, associated with what you may call the first generation of caustics. And then as you keep moving uh, in this direction, keep evolving, uh, you get fewer and fewer of these red dots, right? And the reason for that is clear. You have this exponential proliferation of caustics or exponential proliferation of branches, but each branch individually is getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and eventually you just approach random waves again. Okay, so now we're just going to, so just go quickly through the calculation. So we already have seen We've seen the Rayleigh distribution, which is the distribution of wave heights if you assume Gaussian random C and the narrow banded spectrum, right? That's just the distribution of the wave heights. It's basically just the distribution of the, um, the magnitude of psi if you want to think in terms of quantum mechanics. And, uh, and then, so now we have the situation where because of the scattering, you have regions of classically higher density and regions of classically lower density. So now if you want to know what the distribution of wave heights is, you have to do it in each region because in each region, the wave height, the average wave height is going to be proportional to the square root of the classical, um, the classical ray density, right, or the square root of the energy. And so, and then if you have a distribution of, uh, of classical ray densities, then you can do this convolution. So I here is um, is the um, is basically, if you like, it's, it's just the ray density. It's just the classical ray density, and uh, and pi of h is the likelihood of getting of getting um, um, wave height h um, from from random waves from Ray, from Rayleigh given intensity i. And then you have to multiply by the likelihood of having a region with density, with ray density i, and, uh, and you do the convolution. And, uh, and again, so there's sort of two pieces coming in. Watch one is, so all the wave dynamics is coming in here, the Rayleigh distribution, and this part uh, is purely based on the ray dynamics, okay? And, uh, and you can do the calculation, and you end, when you do the convolution, you end up with something called the K distribution. A, a Bessel function, right? So this is the probability of getting a wave height greater than x times the significant wave height. So you can you can calculate this thing um, analytically, and uh, and here's a simulation. Um, now this I should know this is for a rather extreme case where where this freak index is strong, so very strong scattering. So um, the deviations from Rayleigh are very very uh, strong. 
right? So in this case, if you look again at extreme waves, um, the probability uh, goes, um, you know, should be one in a hundred million, right? If you believe in random ways, but actually it's more like one in 30,000. So the probability is enhanced by uh, more than three orders of magnitude in this case, right? Um, I do want to point out the reason I plot the extreme case here is because actually the analytics that I just showed you is analytics for small gamma, but you can see that it actually works quite well even for gamma equal three. Okay, and then you can go and you can see the, uh, so here calculate the enhancement of probability. So you can see, again, uh, this is just the enhancement, how much more likely you see are to see an extreme wave compared to the random wave prediction. And you can see even, you know, for the region of uh, gamma of order one, which is what you typically expect in the ocean, you already are seeing one or two orders of magnitude increase, which is obviously something quite significant. Okay. So then for the, um, for the ne next uh, part of the talk, um, I want to talk, um, I want to kind of come back. So we've been talking, we t started talking about uh, ray dynamics, and then we talked about the influence of ray dynamics on wave statistics. And I want to come back and just talk a little bit more about, uh, about ray dynamics. Okay? And the question is, okay, so we understand that we can, we have this nice correspondence uh, between ray dynamics and wave dynamics, where if, we, if I tell you um, the ensemble, if I tell you what the distribution of uh, scatter, the scattering potential is classically, then you, I can go and calculate, I can figure out the probability of getting an extreme wave and how much that probability is enhanced compared to if I didn't have uh, scattering, right? But now a question is, can we establish such a correspondence for individual hot spots in the intensity map, right? So let me show you uh, what I mean. So the so first thing, uh, just some kind of definitions. Um, we're going to go back to now, ha we're going to ha uh, have motion be in the y direction, right? And, uh, and so x is our transverse coordinate, right? And we're just going to start with two um, parallel trajectories initially separated by epsilon in the x direction, and they will evolve, they will stretch, or you know, they will stretch, focus, or defocus, uh, whatever, they, whatever they do. And we're just going to look at you know, this, this, this stretching ratio and then take the logarithm, right? So sort of a very standard thing that we do in semi-classics. Uh, if in particular, if we go to large times, we know that this will just go like t times the Lyapunov exponent, right? Okay, and so, but, but here's a picture. So, uh, so here um, in this uh, picture, and unfortunately x is, is this way, uh, but so the motion, you can, you, can, you can see the waves are moving, the rays and the wa waves are moving this way. So you ha see here the hot spots, the region of high density. Um, there's some Gaussian smearing that's applied uh, that's applied here kind of to make, to make the picture look nice. And here at each point, we're calculating um, basically the stretching exponent of the trajectories going through, the, through that point. Uh, and again, uh, there may be multiple trajectories going through that point. So again, we apply some kind of Gaussian smearing, uh, the same Gaussian smearing as over here to make the pictures uh, you know, correspond. And you can basically see uh, you know, particularly in the earlier evolution, you know, wherever you have high density, you have low stretching exponent, again, which is physically not at all surprising, right, given, given, what, um, we've, given what we've already seen, right? But, uh, but we can make this really quantitative. So now what we can do is we can kind of take slices where we take a slice in Y. Uh, first we do it before the caustics, and then we do it in the region of the first, uh, the first generation of caustics, and then we do another slice uh, after the first generation of caustics, and then we're going to do a scatter plot of density versus uh, stretching exponent. And, uh, and so this is what we see. This is sort of before, uh, before the first caustics form, you sort of just see something completely random, but you also see all the stretching exponents are around 0.01, so basically nothing and all the intensities are around one, nothing interesting has happened. But now we look at the region in the first generation of caustics, and now you see, you know, this almost, I mean, obviously there's randomness here, but this almost perfect correlation, 
right? So, um, so basically, um, you know, all the points associated with high density are associated with less than average stretching. Now, again, intuitively, that's not at all surprising, uh, but uh, but it was a little bit surprising, you know, to see the effect, you know, be so strong um, visually. And this is also this is a little bit after the first generation of caustics, and this is sort of later on, a few generations later. Uh, you still see a trend, you still see a correlation, but it's, uh, uh, but it's more washed out. Um, now the next thing I'm uh, just going to show you is now we sort of collect data over the whole, the whole field here. And um, for every value of the density, so we find all the points with density where the aver density uh, is three times the average density, and then we calculate the average stretching exponent, and you see of this kind of figure. So you're seeing that, of course, for kind of the average regions uh, in our field where the density is one, the stretching exponent is positive, right? So that's not surprising because this is a chaotic region. So on average, the stretching exponent is positive. But basically, all the, all the regions of high density are regions of below average stretching density, stretching exponent. Okay, so that's telling us that the behavior of the stretching exponent can be sort of used as a proxy uh, for the behavior of the density. And we already know the density, in turn, tells us about the wave statistics, right? So it seems like we should be able to calculate, um, you know, the properties of the wave statistics by looking more carefully at the behavior of the ray stretching exponent. Now, what does the exponent actually look like? So, so one thing you do is you can just, uh, you, do, you have your evolution and you calculate, you have of course lots and lots of trajectories um, and you can calculate uh, the average exponent, okay? Again, this exponent is just the logarithm of the stretching ratio between time zero uh, or y equals zero in this case and some value of y, right? And then you can calculate also the variance and higher moments. Now, what do we expect? So, we already, I already said, right, obviously for large times, we hope that this is going to be linear, right, where the slope is nothing other than the Lyapunov exponent, right? And similarly, the variance is going to be linear, which makes sense because we think of, you know, having some kind of uh, random walk or, or uh, diffusion um, uh, happening, right? But, uh, but the sort of thing that's a little bit surprising is if you look over here, right, around y equals 120, remember that's just the area where the first caustics are forming, right? And the area the where the first caustics are forming, you actually, the average exponent is actually negative, and, um, and the variance is huge. It sort of far exceeds what you would, you know, guess by just extrapolating the linear behavior, right? So you, it means that you have many more than, exp even though the, av the Lyapunov exponent of the system is positive, right? So on average, the trajectories are supposed to be defocusing. Um, in this particular region, at these times of order the Lyapunov time, you actually have a lot of trajectories that are, um, that are focusing instead of defocusing, okay? And I know, for example, Steve Tomsevich already a long time ago in his study of acoustic waves, I believe you found that you know, again, a lot of what we're calling the hotspots were associated with regions of, you know, where the trajectories are focusing for a while before, before they diverge. <laughs> At least that's one interpretation, right? Uh, it's there, but they're not really stable, right? Because, of course, if you, evolve, if you keep evolving in time, right, they eventually... Exactly, right? So, these, so, so anything basically below zero here sort of would be stable, right? But it's a finite time stability, of course, okay? So, um, so yeah, so this, of course, great, this, this sort of unexpected behavior greatly ex enhances the hotspot uh, phenomenon be beyond sort of the naive, naive expectations if you just sort of believe the, the stretching happens uh, linearly in time, okay? So, uh, so given, you know, given, again, the correspondence between the density evolution and the stretching exponent evolution, it seems like the stretching exponent, um, which is, again, a purely classical array quantity, is something that, you know, can be studied 
in its own right, but then the natural sort of question is, how sort of system specific is this evolution? For example, if you're dealing with acoustic waves versus ocean waves versus optical waves or microwaves, um, et cetera, uh, can we kind of generalize this behavior, right? So, um, so here's the general setup. So we have some kind of scattering in the random potential, and we're going to assume that the, um, that the random potential is weak, so it has some root mean square fluctuations, which are much smaller than the kinetic energy, so we're in this weak uh, small angle scattering regime, and we assume it's semi-classical. So um, again, the, the size, the spatial extent of the bumps uh, or the correlation length is large compared to the wavelength, right? So the so first thing I've already kind of talked about, but I'll remind you, if you just um, keep the form of the potential fixed, but you vary the strength, then uh, the Lyapunov length sort of has the scaling as uh, potential strength to the minus two-thirds. So if you make the potential weaker, you just have to wait longer to, um, to, have, the, uh, to have the hot spots appear. But, if you, but as long as you're willing to wait long enough, or in other words, if you're just willing to rescale um, all your variables, uh, the physics is actually exactly the same. Again, again, the only condition is the scattering has to be weak. Now, if this, if this, um, if, uh, this condition is, um, is uh, violated, then, of course, the universality breaks down. So we don't consider the situation where, for example, backscattering is something that is a significant effect. Right? Okay. What about different dispersion relations? Right? So we already saw you know, at the very beginning for deep water waves, you have this funny... Uh, behavior where um, where the fr uh, where the dispersion ratio of frequency goes as uh, goes as wave number uh, to the one half, which means that actually, for example, uh, long waves in the ocean travel faster than short waves, or the opposite of what you have with uh, non-relativistic particles, right? And then you have other dispersion relations for for light or vibrating membranes. You have the wave equation. Uh, beta equal three half capillary waves, et cetera, okay? So, so it seems, you know, so this beta is a free parameter, uh, but now what one can show is that as long as one is working in the regime of small angle scattering, then uh, scattering by this kind of, uh, in this kind of Hamiltonian is a completely equivalent to scattering in this Hamiltonian with some correction factor, right? So in other words, any kind of scattering, no matter what, um, what kind of dispersion you have is basically equivalent to scattering uh, in the usual for non-relativistic particles for the Schrodinger equation, uh, if you like, as long as you make the appropriate rescaling of the parameters, or again, if you like, as long as you correctly, properly rescale uh, your Lyapunov uh, length. Okay? And that's kind of illustrated here. So you have here a numerical uh, simulation right, for different dispersion relations. And you see, when if you, you rescale the forward distance, you see uh, the behavior sort of looks very similar. Now, you might notice it's actually not, uh, not, not exact. And the reason is that the exact correspondence, again, only works for small angle scattering. Here in the simulation, um, the strength is finite. And it turns out that the first correction goes like 2 over beta, so if the beta so it's most visible for beta um, equal one half, um, which yeah, which is actually the ocean wave uh, example, right? But if you but if you really send um, the scattering strength to z to uh, to be small, then um, the dispersion relation becomes completely irrelevant. Um, the last thing that one might ask is, well, what about different correlation functions, right? So uh, so so far, I think everything has been using assuming Gaussian correlation of this random potential, but where if you assume some other kind of correlation, again, one can show there's, uh, I won't go into all the gory details, but one can show that there's, um, there's an appropriate rescaling you can do where you can sort of rescale a, any, cor um, a, 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 any um, random disorder uh, uh, potential into any other random disorder potential. And, uh, and here's the, yeah, here's the formula, right? So it involves the fourth derivative um, of the correlation function. 
basically the fourth derivative because you're not really interested in v, you're really interested in the second derivative of, of uh, v, which is what enters into um, your Jacobian matrix, right, or monodromy matrix, if you like, right? That's sort of telling you um, about the stretching. Okay, so and again, you see different correlation functions, again, sort of perfect uh, correspondence. So this suggests that, you know, these curves really are universal. It doesn't matter what kind of waves you're dealing with, what kind of random potential you're dealing with, how strong the potential is, as long as it's weak um, compared to the kinetic energy. Okay, and then the last thing is one can actually try to compare to a 1D model, right? So I've already said we're working in this weak scattering regime, so that means if the initial angular spread is small, it will continue to be small, at least for a while, right? Uh, so then when, uh, the motion in a 2D potential, if you're thinking about small, uh, small angles whether, um, from the y-axis, is going to be physically equivalent to motion in one dimension with, uh, with a time dependence, right? Basically uh, replacing y with t, right? And so, if you, if you further, if you discretize it, if you can think of it as, a, as, a, as doing multiple steps of a quantum map, then you're just doing kicks with some uh, kick strength uh, Vxx at each step, which is a random variable, right? And then what we're interested in is multiplying a bunch of these matrices together um, and then taking the 1-1 one, one matrix element, which is the... Uh, stretching, uh, stretching in the x direction, uh, and then taking the logarithm of that. Right? So, so the alpha depends only going to depend on the distribution of these, uh, the second derivative of the potential. Um, and one can actually now, it seems like this is something that one should be able to, you know, do um, analytically, or at least one might hope one can do something analytically. So I've, I'm only been able to sort of uh, to obtain. The short time dynamics, but from a short time dynamics, you can already see, for example, that the average uh, stretching exponent uh, is negative. The variance, of course, is positive, and you can see how it grows. Um, and, uh, and you can also compare 2D and 1D, and again, you see it's the same behavior, right? So, um, and um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll just, I'll just mention a couple of things. Uh, one can, of course, go look at higher moments, right? So, you know, looked at the average stretching exponent, uh, the means, uh, the variance, but then one can look at the skewness and the kurtosis, right? Um, so, basically, the mean uh, third power and the mean uh, fourth power of the stretching exponent properly normalized. Now, again, you see at large times, again, forward direction is equivalent to time, in our picture, and you can see at large time, skewness goes to zero, which it's supposed to do. The kurtosis approaches three, which it's supposed to do, which is telling us the distribution approaches a Gaussian distribution. But again, in this intermediate region, the distribution is very, very far from Gaussian. You have, again, this negative skewness. You have this huge uh, positive uh, excess kurtosis, which again is telling you you're going to have many more events uh, where, you're foc where, the, where the exponent is negative, where you're focusing instead of defocusing, um, than you would expect naively. And uh, just finally, you know, don't, again, I have uh, you know, zero minutes left, but uh, I'll just mention one can sort of try to generalize this. Um, so, so far everything has been, uh, we have um, about the situation of uh, where the where um, the average uh, kick strength, if you like, the average Vxx uh, is zero, um, and you have some variance, but now you can generalize that to where the average of, uh, of the second derivative of the potential is non-zero. So you might imagine, for example, you're moving in some channel where the transverse potential is harmonic, and then you have a uh, random uh, potential on top of the harmonic, right? So then, uh, so then Vxx is going to be a constant plus something that's randomly fluctuating. And, um, and so then it turns out, again, I'm, I don't have time to explain how, but you have this new universal parameter, which is a ratio of the appropriate um, powers of, uh, 
of the uh, of the mean and uh, the and the and the standard deviation. And again, if you so if you so you have to do the proper rescaling, and then as a function of this dimensionless uh, quantity, you get different uh, you get different curves. So this is the case where um, where this is uh, where this is positive, meaning that on average you're actually uh, you have a stable, you have stable restoring motion, stable harmonic motion, and you can see these kinds of oscillations. Eventually, at large times, you still have uh, you still have linear growth, you still have Lyapunov uh, type growth because you know the variance, um, the disorder basically wins out, but you have yes, they have these fluctuations. This is the case where, if you like, you have an inverted harmonic oscillator. And, uh, and there, of course, everything is um, unstable from uh, the beginning. So I'll so I <laughs> get to stop here. Uh, so the summary is um, that uh, rays refracted by uh, weak random potential form regions of above an average density. Um, and, this is, uh, and, and these uh, regions, they survive averaging over initial wave direction and wavelength, the, uh, despite the fact that the individual trajectories are chaotic. Uh, you can obtain quantitatively, quantitatively the wave height distribution uh, by doing appropriate averaging. Uh, we saw the importance of the freak index gamma. And we also saw that the evolution of the credit, uh, classical stretching exponent uh, is key to understanding the wave dynamics on the Lyapunov scale. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So questions? So um, one criterion you didn't mention for uh, applicability